He was loaded with medicines. One of them was Valium. And when we started to rehearse, he couldn't remember the lines. And I thought, Lawrence Olivier, you know, he did right. three and a half hour plays. And he can't remember the lines. And it was because of Valium. And he stopped taking them. Then he could remember the lines. He was also having a nervous breakdown because he'd just been fired from the National. We had a strange sort of relationship. It, it started, he was Lord Olivier, and we're back to British class system again. And we were going to do this film, and I'd never met him. And about a fortnight before we, we started, I got a letter from him, and he said, uh, uh, you may be wondering, because I'm Lord Olivier, how to address me. <laughs> and he said, from the moment we shake hands on meeting, you must call me Larry forever. <laughs> so that was great. And he was very funny because I had a television in my dressing room and I was watching Wimbledon. I love tennis. And he came by my dressing room and he went, you're watching television. I said, yes, I said, it's Wimbledon. I love tennis. He said, you mean you can watch television between takes? I said, yes. I don't think I could do that. He said, I work between takes. I'm always thinking about the part between takes. I said, well, I've already thought about the part. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I'd watch, watch Wimbledon <laughs> so he said uh, can I watch television with you <laughs> so I said yes I said I, I, I won't disturb you in, in there and tell you anything's on he said, I said you can come in anytime I like he said can I I said yeah any, anytime you like and he did and he gave me the greatest compliment I've ever had in my life we did a scene very emotional scene, he was going to shoot me. And at the end of it, he looked at me, he said, you know, Michael, he said, I thought I had an assistant. I see I have a partner. And I, I, I went, that is the greatest thing anyone ever said. What the bloody hell's all this? Do you know what the bloody time is? It's two o'clock in the bloody morning. I know. Well, the wife says that the Fletcher sent you. What's so bloody important he couldn't wait until the morning? <laughs> Listen, I'm not in the mood for playing silly buggers. I made a mistake. What? I made a mistake. What about? Never mind. Listen, I don't like it when some top nut comes pushing his way in and out of my house in the middle of the night. Bloody well tell me who sent you. You're a big man, but you're in bad shape. With me, it's a full-time job. Now behave yourself. <coughs> Good night, Mrs. Bramby. Welcome to part two of two of our Michael Caine tribute. So this is a joint presentation of Film Gold and Stinky Paws with me, Anthony Rotuna, and my good friend, podcasting legend. I said that last time. Let's I'm just say it again. Word, word legend. It's great. You just yeah. keep using it. It's fine. Yeah, no problem. Scott Phipps, <laughs> welcome back. Oh, it's it seems like weeks since we were last together. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Who would have known it was about 45 seconds? <laughs> Right, so last time we counted down our 10 to 6. If you've got them written down there, should we just bosh through them, just the names? So my 10, mine were Death Trap at 10, Ipcrest File at 9, Harry Brown at 8, Italian Job at 7, and Hannah and her sisters at 6. So just give us your 10 to 6 again, See, just the names. Yours is a great list of great movies. Okay. Mine just looks a bit weird now, and I'm looking at this. <laughs> uh, at 10, Austin Powers, gold member for a start. You know, Batman Begins at 9. I have Mona Lisa at 8. Yeah. Sleuth, which is going to appear in your top five, I had at 7. Probably. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, if at all. It's got to. I know you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had the Ipcrest file at six which you had a little bit further down on. i had it at nine yeah, yeah. but that was good because we we sort of uh, half agreed that you would go for some more wacky choices otherwise we might have uh, almost the same top 10 almost there is but... a real danger that you and i would have had exactly the same top five <laughs> yeah. i deliberately placed sleuth a bit further down because of that as well i do love his performance in sleuth mm. but I, there's stuff i want to talk about in this part of the show you know and i've included probably four genuine classics and one that is sort of regarded as a classic and quite rightly so okay that's, that's even more tantalizing for you there you are yeah <laughs> what a tease 
Okay, you ready, mate? Five, we are going into okay into the top five, and I'm going to go first on this one, if that's okay. Mm, absolutely. Obviously, now as you hit the top five, they are going to get a little bit more recognisable, a little bit more blockbustery. You know, sweated over where to put this one in the top five. It was going to be top five from the start. Zulu. Ah. Oh, sorry, sorry, forgot one parody. In um, sorry, but <laughs> in bottom, Eddie Hitler says, Zulus, thousands of them. Thousands of them. The funny thing being that obviously Michael Caine didn't have the Cockney accent. Was Nigel, but Nigel Green says that line in the film. You know, it's him, you what, know, the big imposing Nigel Green rules. Oh, yeah. But it's him, says the actual line. Because what Adrian yeah. Edmondson, as Eddie Hitler says, is... Um, don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes, lads. And he says, they'd have won if they kept their eyes shut. They'd have won if they kept their eyes shut, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I did interrupt it. Yeah, go on. No, Number five, no. Zulu, go, go for it. It has to be here somewhere. Is it in your top five? Because you didn't mention it. No, it's not in my top ten. Ooh. Honestly, I know, I know. I watched it the other day. I thought the fighting looked a bit fake. Fair enough. I don't <laughs> like stuff that, it, it's my prejudice. I don't like anything that makes the British Empire look glorious. Aha, okay. Yeah, I studied no, no, no. history, and uh, mm-hmm. I I just didn't like it. Michael Caine was brilliant. Stanley Baker was brilliant. Yeah. It's a good film, yeah. But And I kind of, because I knew it was going to be in your top ten, I, I held off and put something like Harry Brown in there. And stuff. No, that makes absolute sense. The reason I chose it is I underestimated its value for many years. Similar to when we spoke about in the last episode about when you see a movie at Christmas and it's a traditional sort of bank holiday movie and you become comfortable with it. And Zulu was always there. Zulu was one of those bank holiday staples, you know, Mm. it got its premiere, I think on new year's Eve 76 on ITV, Mm. you know, and it was a constant for years and years and years. My friend and and part-time co-host on real Britannia, Mark, it's for years been his birthday movie because of that comfort, nostalgia sort of background to it. And for me, I just sort of dismissed it as, yeah, that, that's one of those bank holiday movies. Not one of those comfortable bank holidays, but just one of those bank holiday movies. Mm. It holds a record as being the only movie on Stinking Paws to be reviewed twice mm. so far, because we've got our 10th anniversary coming up and we're going to be reviewing other movies again. But it's the mm. first one to be reviewed twice. And it wasn't until two, three years ago we reviewed it on the Real Britannia podcast. And I did a Rainbow Valley documentary on the making of zulu and there's this fantastic book called with some guts behind it sheridan hall i think is the author it's a fantastic lot warts and all it goes into the real minutiae of the making of the movie the problems of recording in south africa how michael kane got the job this famous story when terry stamp got the starring role in peter ustinov's film version of billy budd we finally had enough money to move into a two-bedroom flat in ebury street I now had a new agent called Dennis Selinger. Dennis and I hit it off right from the start, and we are friends to this day. He sent me a play from a producer called Michael Codron, a man of great taste and courage, and someone I already knew. The play in question was Next Time I'll Sing to You by James Saunders. The deal was £7 a week for two weeks' rehearsal, and £20 a week for the run, which I thought would be short. It opened at my old stamping ground, the Arts Theatre, and was a big hit with the critics, although the audiences were on the sparse side. However, we managed to stay open long enough for word to get around, and we eventually became such a success that our wages were doubled and we transferred to the Criterion Theatre in Piccadilly. There I was, in the West End at last. I was 30 years old. One night, Stanley Baker, with whom I had worked all those years ago in the Hilling Korea, came backstage to visit me. By now, he was one of the biggest stars in the British cinema. In the show, I played a Cockney, and Stanley explained that he was starring in and producing a film called Zulu, in which there was a Cockney character. If I was interested in trying for the part, I'd have to go to see the director, Cy Enfield, in the bar of the Prince of Wales Theatre at 10 o'clock the next morning. Cy Enfield was a tubby, slow-speaking, slow-moving, middle-aged American. As he stood up and shook hands, his first words were, I'm sorry to have wasted your time, Michael but we've already given the part to James Booth. We figured that he looked more like a Cockney than you do. I knew Jimmy Booth, who was a very good actor, and I had to agree he did look more like a Cockney than me. This was a terrible disappointment, and the rejection would have floored me at one time, but I'd suffered so much of it I just went into my routine defence, which was numb mode. Sorry, kid, he said. That's okay, I smiled. Maybe next time. The bar was very long, and I could not wait to reach the door and get out of there 
away from yet another humiliation. I opened the door and was just about to disappear when Sai shouted, Michael, come back here. I walked back. Can you do any other accent but Cockney? When I was in rep, I was doing 50 plays a year using every accent from American gangster to Lord of the Manor. I can do any accent you want. Can you do upper crust English? That's the easiest one of all, I shrugged, hoping desperately that I could remember how to do it. So I stared at me for a while, and then he said, You know, you don't look like a cockney. You look like one of those snotty blue-blooded English guys. I looked in the mirror behind the bar. Maybe he was right, I thought. I was six feet two inches tall, very slim, with long blonde hair and blue eyes. I was nobody's idea of a typical cockney. In this movie, Sai interrupted my thoughts, there is a character called Gonville Bromhead. He's a very snobbish and aristocratic lieutenant who thinks that he is superior to everybody, especially the character played by Stanley, who will be here in a minute, he added. Would you mind waiting? I agreed to this instantly and afterwards stood there feigning disinterest while they huddled in a corner, discussing my suitability. Finally they turned to me and Sai said, Can you do a screen test with Stanley on Friday morning? I walked out of the bar again, but this time with an almighty spring in my step. He's, he's recognised as the film that gave Michael Caine his break. Okay, if, if that bar had been shorter, he would have walked out of that room and never got the call back, which is incredible when you think about it. You know, it's one of those twists of fate. Yeah. But as for the performance, it's a little bit, not disjointed, but you can't imagine Caine being posh. I think the voice isn't too bad. It's I prefer not it to bad. his New England accent, to be exactly. perfectly honest. Exactly. When we're talking about the American accents and how yeah. uncomfortable you feel watching them sometimes because it's yeah. not Michael Caine, this sort of suits him. This sort mm. of actually works. Mm. And because of the work that Baker and Enfield put in in creating such a mammoth sort of epic spectacle, mm. and he's one part in a thousand different parts in this movie that works so well. I mean, to me, he's, he's not, the lead in this i mean it's baker's movie obviously mm. and even to be second build is disputable because you know you've got um nigel green and all those other background characters but there's something about that performance that people must have noticed and quite rightly led him onto the career that he developed over the next 60 years it's sort of in there because of its importance mm. as well as the performance I think it just needs to be recognised. I, I just love the movie. And to keep it out of the top five for me would have been a scandal. No, fair enough. And we'll do, yeah, just another plug. You did a Rainbow Valley in the making of Zulu. So I'll stick mm. it in the show notes for sure. Mm. All right. Nice one. Right. Now, my number five, I think this might be in your top ten. I can't imagine. Well, I'm not going to say that. Number five <laughs> is Educating Rita. Now, just tell us quickly, is that figure in your top five? No. Oh, it doesn't. Interesting. Right. Before you go okay, into go on, it, I'll just tell on. you why. It's, it's, okay, go on. Because we have this wealth of Michael Caine goodness, you have to leave out something. Yeah. I love the movie. Real Britannia focuses on British movies. We've reviewed it. Absolutely adore it. I was focusing more on the 60s stuff. I think I became mm. a little bit overwhelmed by the 60s Michael Caine. Mm. Looking at my top 10, yeah, I could have replaced Gold Member. You know, we've, we've yeah, educated, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've educated but, it. But as I said, you, quite you took right, one for the team. And I did, and, and you've got it at number there. five, so I will, I'll <laughs> quite happily be there yeah. with you at number five on this. Mostly. Okay. I was absolutely shocked because I watched it two weeks ago. I had forgotten that it's actually billed as a comedy. Yeah, That's it's weird, isn't it? I guess it's a comedy with a bit of drama, but I always took it as a drama with a bit of comedy, mm. and I was quite surprised. I'd remembered it very differently. I mean, I yeah. still loved it. If I'd done this list without rewatching it, it probably would have been even higher because it just went down a tiny bit. Because Ooh, okay. when Judy Walters turned up, it was a bit like Shirley Valentine, which I think yeah. is a good film as well. But I always remembered it as being a, a few rungs above Shirley Valentine, and it kind of is. But when she turns up, just with this really outrageous Scouse accent, it kind of works when you realise it's a comedy. But I honestly had forgotten it was billed as a comedy. But I think if we take Michael Caine at his word, he said he never played drunk by getting drunk and yeah. I'll take him at his word to me that drunk acting is just fantastic it's the voice do you remember there's a really funny bit where um his partner is having an affair with um what's the name of the guy who was married to Judy Dench Michael Williams is that him yeah yeah it's pretending That's Michael Williams in the film of course he is yeah yeah, yeah Michael Williams yeah 
and uh, he keeps pretending he's on the phone every yeah, time Michael that's Caine. Right. But the last time Michael Caine says, uh, and this is a sort of drug, we well, had the phone disconnected. <laughs> And he's pretend Michael Williams is pretending to be on the phone to someone. Michael Caine picks up the phone, says this guy's name, fuck off, and then pretends to hang up. Hang up. I saw something years ago, and I don't think it was Michael Caine that said it, but actors make a massive mistake when they play drunk by rolling all over the place and slurring yeah. their words. And that. Yes. But in reality, a real drunk is a person that's incapacitated trying to appear sober. Yes. That's so it. you sort of stand up more straight and you put on a bit of a voice that you wouldn't normally but not a token of yeah. that ad falling all over the place so yeah. drunk people don't do that they try to overcompensate for their drunkenness yeah and appear sober but they're obviously drunk and that's yeah. what Kane does in this but also he does lapse into complete blind fucking drunk as well yeah <laughs> seeing him with a beard as well you know it's, yeah. it's just wow this is something different again it's that golden age of the early 80s film for mm. british movie handmade films type era where we were just banging these movies out and it was like we were unstoppable you know sort of like the chariots of fire and the rita yeah. and bob twos and all of that sort of stuff you know i just love that period we, we spoke about this when we talked about mona lisa in the last episode the problem that you get with this type of movie because it's based on a stage play it can appear a bit stage bound and it's sort of relying on two people's conversation it doesn't happen in this movie at all because mm. obviously you've got the weight of michael kane up against julie walter's first starring first role film. in a movie wasn't it yeah first because film role first film role second possibly film role. yeah Something because like she was in a thing called she'd be wearing pink pajamas or something which was a film for around about the same sort of time is that the one she's on some sort of adventure holiday thing? I think, you know. God, blimey, that's tripped me back. I haven't there seen you that go. since yeah. it came out. There we go. We'll review that for Real Britannia, mate. <laughs> but before that, she was known for like Victoria Wood, wasn't she? And Wooden yeah. Walters and, and all of that yeah. sort of stuff. And for her to go into something like this in her first or second movie on, she got, did she get, she got Oscar nominated as well as BAFTA, didn't she? I Possibly. Think. Definitely BAFTA. Maybe yeah. Oscar. Yeah. Incredible. No, brilliant. In, yeah. yeah. And, and, we were talking about the three ages of Michael Caine and I said, this was a dead period. Didn't I? I sort of said, mm. you know, 78 onwards for about 10, 15 years. But in that period, you get things like this. You get these little shafts of Michael Caine gold coming yeah. through the darkness. Did he capitalize on that? I mean, obviously Hannah and her sisters came after this a few years after. Yeah. yeah. Not really. I don't think he, he didn't, did. Actually. Did he? There's this no. still, Oh, Michael, come on. You had the golden opportunity to be box office. Number one throughout the eighties, you know, taking on yeah. the rat pack, you know, <laughs> you know? Mm. <laughs> but it never happened. But I'm, I'm glad it didn't because we then get the third year of Michael Caine, which is absolutely superb. Yeah. It's funny when we did the Brando show, as I said at the beginning of part one, Brando at some point started phoning it in. I mean, you could even yeah. trace that back to the sixties, but what, my friend uh, David Wills, who was on the show with me, what we said is that even in the bad films, every now and again, like when Brando has a touch of anger or he'll do <laughs> something, and you'll say that magic is still there. Yeah, It's just buried, and he can't be bothered most of the time. And maybe Michael Caine, even when he was phoning it in and you know making Jaws to finance his house or whatever it was, <laughs> uh, there's still that little bit of magic. But what he did for this film, he um, put on a couple of stone and he grew a beard, as you said. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to say everyone with a beard is like this, but there's something about a middle-aged man growing a beard. It's almost like you're kind of letting yourself go a bit. Like you can't <laughs> be asked, up. <laughs> you can't be asked to shave. You know, it's that kind of thing. He plays middle-aged jaded so brilliantly. And yeah. there, obviously there's probably something deep down in him. But I mean, again, at this point, he's, he's acting, isn't he? He's 50 years old. So. Exactly 50. Yeah. 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 83, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just think the drunk acting, again, take him at his word. It's a thickness in the voice you get. I mean, I went to drama school many years ago, and our teacher said exactly the same as the thing as you were saying earlier. Someone was playing drunk, and they said, what are you doing staggering around? Okay, people yeah. do stagger around if, if they're really, really, really... Blind happy. drunk, yeah. Yes, yeah. but Michael Caine in this film is more of an alcoholic who just has a tot through the day, you know, starting from the morning or whatever, you know, it's that a, kind of alcoholic. A functioning alcoholic, functioning as, it's, alcoholic. as it's known as, yes, yeah. yeah, which has been thrown at me many times. <laughs> <laughs> what about high-functioning alcoholic? High-functioning yeah. alcoholic, that's yeah, me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, talking of um, 
I've just been saying how good his drunk acting was. Let's talk about this masterclass he did, which is on YouTube. You can watch it in all its glory. I wasn't sure whether he was drunk when he was doing it or not, but you you like this, don't you? I don't think he was drunk. I think this is Michael Caine imparting his knowledge on the next generation of actors and actresses, who includes Celia Imry, who is there. And there's another couple of faces that I reckon that I've recognised that have gone on to other things. And it is just amazing. It is 80s Michael Caine. The one we all envisage as the black bomber jacket wearing, cigar smoking, big glasses, crinkly yes. hair Michael Caine. Yes, yes, yes. And he's giving this acting masterclass to a group of wannabe actors or, you know, fledgling actors and actresses. And it's funny, but at the same time, it's very good, the actual advice he gives, but it's just the way he gives it. I read somewhere that the actual transcript of this thing was actually written down and released as a book because it is a very good acting masterclass, you know, as as a guideline for people who want to get into the business. And he's probably the least likely person to give it. So I'll just throw it open to Michael Caine now, mate. Here he is now. Now, you see actors and they're acting and they change. And it's an infinitesimal thing in the eyes as they change eyes as they're talking. Can you see my eyes Mm -hmm. changing here? And I'm blinking. Now, that is two of the worst things to do. First of all, you never change eyes. And what you do is you pick an eye. Now, which eye do you pick? I look at with this eye because the camera is there. I look at this eye at your eye there. Mm -hmm which brings my face, you can see. If I look with this eye at that eye, look what you get. You see the difference? But it's the same look. And if I keep blinking, it weakens me. But if I'm talking to you and I don't blink and I just keep going, you start to listen to what I'm saying. (laughs) And it makes me a very strong person. The camera is like somebody who loves you deeply. It's the most incredible of mistresses or lovers, whichever sex you are, because it will love you forever in spite of the fact that for the rest of your career, except on given occasions, which we will come to, you ignore it. It does not exist. You never look into it. You never know it's there. You just hold the eyes of the other person and listen. And listening is really what acting is all about for movies it's not like the theater it's an entirely different situation when i was in the theater i was inadvertently given some advice by uh, the theater producer when very young i was in repertory in lowestoft and he said to me what are you doing michael and i said nothing sir what do you mean nothing i said well i haven't got anything to say so he said what do you mean you haven't got anything to say He says, of course you've got things to say. You've got wonderful things to say. But you sit there and listen, think of these extraordinary things to say, and then decide not to say them. (laughs) That's what you're doing. And that is the greatest piece of advice I can give to someone who wants to act in movies, to listen and react. The thing I like about Ruby is she's a mature woman. When she gets hold of you, you can feel a lifetime of experience in her. I find I'm going in more for that kind of woman these days. Here, don't you dig your nails in again like you did last Thursday night. I've got scratches all down my back. Great long wheels, they are. Dug her nails right in. She's had two husbands, both dead, and I've got a good idea what they died of and all. She don't keep asking, do you love her, like all these young birds do. She don't even mention love. She knows what she wants, and she's going to get it. If there's any going. Cheers. Cheers. Okay. You've got this whole thing going and flowing in the theatre and she comes in and everything. But in a movie, what you have to do now is you're not... You did that as though you were talking to an audience. Yeah. It's one person. It's only one person. So what it is... Let me see. Where where are we? Gets all this lot off income tax. Business expenses, see? She owns three hairdressers. The thing I like about Ruby... She's a mature woman. When she gets hold of you, you, you can feel a lifetime of experience in her. I find I'm going in more for that kind of woman these days. Here, don't you dig your nails in again like you did last night. I've got wheels all down my back. You know, it's, mm. it's funnier if... 
I've got scra I've got scratches all down my back. Great long wheels they are. Dug and owls right in. You see, you're talking to one person. Yeah. All right, I think I'm number four. I think three of our top four are the same, so we may Let's go for it. Yep. I've got number four, Alfie. So what have you got at number four, Tommy? Alfie. Or, I've got oh, Alfie, got Alfie. Number four. There you go. <laughs> All right. If you don't mind, I'll go first. Uh, Absolutely. No, it's your choice first. Yeah. Just a few brief comments, really. I watched this again. I'd probably seen it twice, and I watched it a couple of weeks ago. And I was quite surprised at all the twists and turns. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's perfect, but I think it's pretty good. He's a lovable Cockney, but when the film goes dark at a couple of points, he does get away with it. Although then you, even within the bits where you think it's getting darker, then you've got that quite comedic fight in the pub. He gets in a fight, and then the whole pub is fighting. Yeah. But what the standout was, um, what blew me away was Vivian Merchant, who was married to Harold Pinter, who had mm -hmm. been in The Offence, which I know is one of your yes, big favourites. absolutely. That scene where she has to have an abortion, that look on her face is absolutely brilliant. She's a great actress, in my opinion. She's great in The Offence as well. Isn't she the wife of Alfie Bass, who's in the sanatorium? That's how they meet. Yeah. yeah. That is always a bit jarring for me because alfie bass an amazing comic actor is married to vivian merchant who we we know for these really serious dramatic roles mm. just sort of thought at the time it's like wow this is a bit of a juxtaposition here you know of almost shakespearean actor against vaudeville comedy almost yeah the tone of the movie shifts so mm. much Does it? absolutely from the backstreet abortions to Jane Asher in the flat, even the beginning where he does the introduction, what's it all about, and all of that, you know, and the Burt Bacharach soundtrack, everything mm. involved in this movie, again, Screaming 60s again, I'm sorry, we keep going back to this. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I first saw this movie, we've had these sort of conversations before, mate, you know, when you're trying to find your feet in your early teens about what your movie tastes are. So for you, you know, you were looking at things like Movie Drome and, and you were relying on Alex Cox to direct you in that direction, yeah. you know. For me, mine was like the Friday night, Saturday night, late night movies when I was like 12, 13, 14. And this came on to BBC early 80s, 81, 82. I'd have been about 12 years old. And, of course, up on the screen immediately, young Michael Caine. At that time, 81, 82, Michael Caine was an old man with big glasses, ginger crinkly hair. And I'm like, wow, that's, you know, because I've probably seen Zulu, but wasn't really too aware of who he was, you know. Yeah. And I'm like, what's this? This is great. It was sort of the language, and I'm thinking, oh, this is a little bit saucy. This is just pushing the envelope a little bit here. And then when I looked, I'm thinking, hang on a minute, this is like mid-60s. This is my mum's era. What's going on here? Yeah. You know? And I'm thinking, this is a very adult movie for something that I thought was subdued back in that era i never thought that sort of thing happened back then mm -hmm. you know and i watched it and i was absolutely enthralled and as you said the plot gets a little bit convoluted because there's so many little side stories because you mm -hmm. get the shelly winters stuff you get Jane, the Jane Asher. Jane Asher. it's just a constant merry-go-round of him doing whatever he does as a lothario in the 60s mm -hmm. and i absolutely adored it and again like the italian job it's become one of those ones that i try to watch quite regularly and in this particular case, although there is a massive supporting cast of very, very famous British actors, he is head and shoulders standing above everybody else in this movie. He's a star. I mean, you can he, see it. Exactly. And yeah. for him to go from Zulu to that, it would be impossible for him not to become a megastar, mm. even though it was possibly a minor British film. He did get no. nominated for an Oscar. So exactly. It just captured it did, the imagination, did didn't carry, it? Yeah. 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 Is it a case of being in the right place at the right time? I don't think so. I think it's a case of, actually, he's bloody good in this. Oh, he is. He's a star, yeah. Mm. And the thing he said, um, he said <laughs> in the masterclass that when he talked to the camera, he did it as if he was talking to one person rather than talking to a big audience. Yeah. And that worked. Jane Asher, of course, was Paul McCartney's girlfriend at that time. I'd completely forgotten she was in it. Yep. Shelley Winters is brilliant. And you got the bit yeah. at the end when Alfie, who I suppose we're supposed to think is about 30, something like that. Is he 30? He's late 20s, isn't he? I late 20s. Know. And yeah, Michael Caine yeah. was, I think he was 32 or 3 when they're making it. Anyway. About right there. And Shelley Winters, of course, um, 
gets a younger guy. I hadn't realised that how ridiculous that guy looked. But anyway, if you watch it again, but um, <laughs> obviously then you've got a little bit of social commentary. The idea that even if you're 30, which is relatively young, there's still younger guys out there. And uh, yeah. she's an older woman, but she's complaining that he's too old. So she's yeah. gone for an even younger guy. <laughs> so I thought that was really good. And then I love the bit. Um, this is a silly little thing, but right at the end when he's on the bridge and that dog appears. Yeah. And do you know, do you know what I was thinking? Because, um, I mean, I do love cats and dogs. I'm a bit of a pet guy. I was thinking when he smiles at the dog, that's probably the most genuine smile he's done. Because he's the rest of the time, <laughs> Alfie as a character, he's, sort he's of playing, Alfie, playing a game. He? Yeah, he's playing a yeah. game. You know, the character, not just Michael Caine. Yeah. But when he uh, sees that dog at the end, it was just nice. You know, the little bit of music. That's a and, great uh, little bit of um, yeah, nice little bit of to, yeah. to finish the movie. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, big fan of Alfie. Love it. That's great that we both had that at four as well. That's probably the only time I think we're going to match. Possibly. Oh, I'm not sure about that. Possibly. Gone, uh, yeah. All right, what's your number three? Number three, we've already spoke about in the last episode, mate. Mine's the Italian job. Ah, oh, right. Three. Okay. We said Screaming 60s, Charlie yeah. Kroger, all of that stuff. I mean, go yeah. back and listen to our comments on the Italian job from what we said before. I like the idea what you said about comfort. It's like comfort food, isn't it? There are films that you put them on. I mean, I get that a little bit. I listen to um, UK Gold, which uh, I suppose in America they call it oldies radio. Yeah. You know, if I'm having a shower in the morning or whatever, if I just want to turn the radio on and I know there's going to be 60 songs, they've got a pretty limited playlist if I was going to make a criticism. but about 30 records. (laughs) Yeah, something like that. (laughs) And funnily enough, Rainbow Valley comes up quite often. I don't know if you notice that. Does the it? Song, by, the song uh, yeah. by Steve Ellis and Love Affair. Excellent. Yeah. But um, it, it's, it's comfort food, isn't it? In, in the form of song, you know? You do know yeah. if you want to listen to a regular sort of 60s chart show, mate, you can always listen to the Rainbow Valley 60s yeah. chart, uh, chart show on Mixcloud, can't you? He's a professional. <laughs> he's not right. bad, the host of that, you know. <laughs> All right, that'll be in the show notes, so that, that's good. <laughs> no problem. All right, my number three... I'm sure this is in your top three. The Man Who Would Be King, 1975. No, because I've only got two oh. left. I've only I've got, two, got left. two left. Oh, yeah, okay. The Man Who Would Be King, I'm going to be honest with you, I struggle with it a little bit. It has all the elements of a movie that I should love and adore mm. because it's got Kane, it's got Connery, it's directed by Houston. It's a big widescreen epic, mid-70s blockbuster. It should have everything that I adore in movies. I like it. I don't love it. Mm. Probably because I didn't discover it until later in life. It wasn't those ones I I found as a teenager. I think I first watched it when I was in my 20s and I thought, okay, by then it was dated. And I just find it just a little bit overblown. Mm. Then again, I love the Italian job. How overblown is the Italian job? You know, I can't use that as an excuse. It would be there in my top 20. So it's your kind of bubbling under. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's there. I mean, it's not one that I would turn to if if I, I think oh i fancy watching something i would not automatically go to that as a michael kane movie well me. as you said to me that i should watch the italian job more maybe you should watch uh yeah exactly. every now and again watch mm. it and it'll probably grow on you this is going to be more your movie than mine mate so i'll let you crack on it's just kane and connery i mean they were friends in real life they had a great time on the set apparently you've got christopher Plummer in there you've got john houston directing it i think michael kane from uh one of his memoirs I think it's actually three, because there's one called Blowing the Bloody Doors Off, which is mm-hmm. sort of the life lessons of Michael Caine with a few of the familiar anecdotes <laughs> weaved in. His hero was Humphrey Bogart. We reviewed Treasure of the Sierra Madre, didn't we? Yes. So I think Caine sort of rose to the occasion. It's a bit silly, yes, of course. Wasn't Bogart originally supposed to starring? It was, it was a, yes. a Houston project from the 50s or something. Every three or four months all through our marriage, Shakira and I have spent many honeymoons in Paris, usually over a long weekend. It's always the same, very simple and completely sybaritic. We eat in all the best restaurants, stay in a luxury hotel, dance all night and sleep all day, and spend all our time just with each other. This particular time we were staying in the Hotel Georges Saint. As I sat up in bed having my first coffee of the day, the phone went and a voice asked, Is that Michael Caine? This is John Houston. I nearly dropped the phone. Here I was, speaking to the one director whom I actually idolised. Yes, Mr. Houston? Call me John. I'm in the Hotel Prince de Gaulle next door to you. Could you come over and see me for a few minutes this morning? Yes, I'll be there in ten minutes. That'll be just fine. I'll be in the bar, he said, and rang off. As I entered the bar, a voice called, Over here, Michael. 
and there he was at the counter, a cigar in one hand and a glass of vodka in the other. He had white hair and a white beard separated by smiling blue eyes that looked as though they had seen it all and decided that it was okay anyway. He looked like God after a bad night and after I heard his voice in real life for the first time. I always thought if ever I heard God speak, that was exactly how he would sound. What do you have, he said. It was too early, really, but I thought, what the hell? I'm never going to meet John Houston for the first time again. A large vodka, I said nonchalantly, and so began a friendship that was to last until his death a few years ago. My vodka came, we touched glasses without a word, and both downed a slug. Now let me tell you what this is all about, he said. For twenty years now, I've been trying to make a film of a short story by Rudyard Kipling called The Man Who Would Be King. I had it all set up at one time a couple of years ago. As a matter of fact, I was sitting in this very bar when I brought together the two stars I was going to use. He paused and took a swig of vodka. I couldn't resist. Who were they? Clark Gable and Humphrey Bogart, he replied with a smile. We had it all set up, and then they both went and died on me. And what's more, it would have been the first time that they had worked together, he added wistfully. I waited for a while to see where I was going to figure in this. Finally, he said, we have now got the backing for the movie, and I want you to play a character called Peachy Carnahan. I found myself blurting out, what part was Bogart going to play? Peachy Carnahan, John replied. I'll do it. Don't you want to read the script? With you directing a story by Rudyard Kipling and a part that Bogart was going to play, how can I lose? I hope you're right, he said laconically. Do you know the story? No, I said. Well, read it. It's very short. The other leading character, their best friends in the movie, is called Daniel Drabbit, the part Gable was going to play. Who do you want to play that? Sean Connery. I remembered how, as a boy, my impossible dream had been to become an actor. In a Houston film I had seen called The Treasure of Sierra Madre, a bunch of misfits were looking for gold, which was their impossible dream. And in it I had identified with the Bogart character, the nobody trying to become a somebody. Now here I was playing a part that was meant for Bogart. In this story, Peachy and Danny were two British army sergeants in India, who set out on their own quest to become the kings of an ancient realm of fabulous wealth called Kafiristan. I was doing the impossible dream. Making a film with Houston. About an impossible dream. And it was all coming true. Yeah, so I think the story is, yeah, they're two sort of adventurers in the, is it the time of the Raj, I think it is? Yeah. Connery gets shot, and because he's wearing some protective shield, he doesn't yeah. bleed, so they decide that he's a god. <laughs> and he plays up to it, and uh, I won't spoil the ending, but the ending is genuinely frightening when they get found out, and they're surrounded by, in the film, it seems like thousands of the locals. Mm. And, um, you know, they meet a sticky end. But, uh, again, I, I th- we've talked about this so many times. When you get into stuff when you're young, you know, you're a child, teenager, young man, It just stays with you, and I haven't seen it for a long time, but I've just got such affection for it. It might be a bit hard overhead, but I think it's generally a pretty, it's a well-regarded film, wouldn't you say? Oh, of course, yeah, mainly because of that trio of Houston, Connery, and Kane. Yeah. The magical joining of three famous stars. You know, Houston was at the twilight of his career. Connery and Kane had had their heyday as such, even though they did go on to other things. And it was just the dream team. I can imagine, what was it, 76? 75. 75, 75. same year as Jaws. Yeah, absolutely. And then you sort of forget Christopher Plummer's in it. He plays uh, Rudyard Kipling. He's Rudyard he? Kipling, isn't he? He's, he's sort of like yeah. the beginning and the tail end of it or whatever, yeah. You mentioned Jaws. Just looking at this, it says, in the 70s, Houston approached Robert Redford and Paul Newman. I imagine they were approached for any film that was going to have a duo, wasn't it? Because they were Anything, approached to yeah. play Brody and Hooper in Jaws. Yeah. With possibly Lee Marvin as Quint, which, or Sterling Hayden. That would have been really good. S- Sterling Hayden would have been That's... the only alternative to Robert Shaw. As well. yeah. Then Lee Marvin was also considered, wasn't it? Yeah, but Lee Marvin yeah. said, I'd rather go fishing than make the film. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, what are we up to? What was your three again, mate? Was My three was the job? Italian job, so I didn't really have to comment on that, unfortunately. All right. So my two, oh, God, my one and two change repeatedly. Uh, I'm going to go with Get Carter. Is um, your number two? Yes. What's your number two? Then? My number two is Muppet Christmas Carol. Oh, no, come on. 
<laughs> All right, I'm going to let you make a serious case. Go on, you go first. Go serious case for Muppet Christmas Carol. <laughs> Again, I don't have to make a serious case this because <laughs> this is totally a personal thing, okay, yes. as we have said. Muppet Christmas Carol, 1991, I think it may have been. Very, very early 90s. We are going into the third era of Michael Caine. Michael Caine has become self-aware at this point, and Michael Caine is having a lot of fun in his movie selections for you know what he wants to do. Michael Caine knows he can't sing. Michael Caine signs up for a fucking musical. Right? <laughs> the balls of the band is, is immense. I love it, strictly yeah. because of that. I have a great affection for the Muppets. Jim Henson had died the year before. This was like the first project that his son had taken over. Nobody ever thought that this would work. It is the best interpretation of A Christmas Carol ever put to film. I will die on this hill, basically. Mm. It shouldn't work. You've got puppets and yeah. Michael Caine. Literally, yeah. that is it. And he looks like he is having so much fun making this movie. I always watch this every single year, the Sunday before Christmas. I don't know why it's always worked out to be the Sunday before Christmas, but that is my run up to the like the Christmas watching period and what I'm going to be watching over Christmas. Mm. And I like to really sort of kick start with this particular movie. The songs, the jokes, the story is familiar to everybody. We all know mm. the story of the Christmas Carol. Michael Caine's interpretation is perhaps not the traditional interpretation we always see alistair sim possibly george, mm, george. oh yeah do we you know but i love it i absolutely love it and and i put this up there because for it to be number two also it's probably one of the ones i've watched the most you know sometimes you can judge how much you love a movie by the amount of times you watch it and because i've watched this every single christmas since 1991 yeah. you know that's 30 years mm. of watching this particular movie not his best performance not by a long shot. One of my favourite Michael Caine performances. Absolutely. I love it. I haven't seen it. so um, What? Sorry? Just, Hello? So, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I can't judge either way. I, you oh. just uh, threw me for a loop there. I just wasn't <laughs> expecting that. Yeah. No, I guess it wouldn't be worth watching it in February, but I'll, no, I'll watch it right. uh, next Christmas. I will. Please yeah. watch it the Sunday before Christmas this okay. year. I'll remind you. <laughs> and then we'll do a stinking pause review. Literally okay. that week. There you go. Well, I think I'm on safe ground saying my number two is your number one. Although, mm -hmm. God, now I'm worried now. What are you going to come out with? You're going to no, put you got, Bullseye. You got, no, you've got You're going to put Bullseye at number one. That's number you? one, yeah. No, I'm pretty sure my number two and your number one is Get Carter. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it is. What can we say? I mean, I have the DVD of this, and I listened. I'd recommend for you, if you haven't listened already and the listeners, listen to Mike Hodges' commentary. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely brilliant. What can we say? I don't know. It's gritty. Have I told you this before, that when he's getting the train on the way, the guy who ends up killing him is on the train with him? Yeah. yeah. I pointed this out to somebody who thought they knew the movie the other day, <laughs> and they're like, shut up. I'm like, no, just watch, because it is an actual fact. The guy that kills him at the end is on the train at the beginning. Yeah. But that, um, what about that score? Because it's so, a weird kind of jazzy score, isn't it? It's Roy Budd, who was one of those sort of library musicians like um, Alan Hawkshaw and all those guys that you used to hear on the test card and all that sort yeah. of like library music. It's brilliant. Again, it shouldn't work, mm. but it does. And it's an integral part of the movie is the soundtrack to this. Mm. I like it personally because I have a great affection for British gangster movies, not so much the lock mm. stocks and all that sort of stuff, but things like Long Good Friday and, and Stanley Baker in Robbery and Payroll and all those sort of yeah. great train robbery type things. You know. And for me, I'm not going to say it is the perfect British gangster movie, but it's bloody close. I mean, my favourite is probably Long Good Friday. Mm. Kane's performance, we said earlier, he very rarely plays a nasty bastard. And he is a nasty bastard in this, but it's not apparent. Because well, he's only going up there to right a wrong. He's only going up to Newcastle yes. because his brother's died. And then yeah. he discovers all this shit that's gone on. And he doesn't do anything particularly nasty. Well, apart from throw Alf Roberts off of <laughs> the multi-story. If, uh, if he'd killed Audrey Roberts, then we'd really have been Exactly, we're in national uproar, mate. Yeah. Well, you see, he's on a mission. He's on a revenge mission. And when you realise that the people who stitched up his brother killed his brother are nasty 
yeah. you kind of root for him. And I guess because he's Michael Caine, you root for him anyway, you know? How weird is it that John Osborne is the villain in... Who we mentioned in part one, who wrote uh, Look Back in Anger, yeah. 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 That is just bizarre, because you don't think that John Osborne was an actor or had any sort of acting capabilities mm. whatsoever. And he's there playing a nastier bastard than Michael yeah. Caine. Well, here's my, um, here's my Beatles reference once again. Many moons ago, we, re- we reviewed How I Won the War. Yeah, we did, yeah. And... Uh, John Lennon was rather shamefully, uh, not shame on his part, but shamefully uh, second build, and is obviously on the front cover of the DVD even now. now. Interestingly, Britt Eklund, I think, was second build originally on this. Right. I mean, she's obviously very attractive. She would, I don't know what she'd done before this, but she was... Uh, Man with the Golden Gun was about the, oh, no, a couple of years after. Was Wicker Man? Of... Wicker Man was a year after as well. That was a couple of years yeah. year after two years after but yeah she must have been known or something i mean she, people mm. knew she was was with peter sellers or had been yeah but she i think she was second build and um she's in it right at the beginning but it it's that scary kind of english gangster world and what john osborne does really well is he's totally calm yeah what we realize now through these decades of really good gangster films is is the calm one that's more menacing because he's not yeah. playing his hand he's just going uh he gives this really robotic. He's like, "Oh, come on, Harry!" And so it sounds like Michael Caine, <laughs> doesn't it? Jack, isn't it? Jack, Jack Carter. Oh, yeah. come on, Jack! He's doing this very deadpan, but it's much mm. more menacing that way. And then um, you get the genuinely really shocking stuff towards the end, where he's knock, you know, Michael Caine sort of knocking him off one by one. There's a bit in the yeah. bookies, and then obviously the bit where he's um, they forced a bottle of whiskey down his brother's throat. Yes. That's why he does the same. And then you got the famous mm. line at the race course. Oh, what is it? Oh, I recognise those eyes. So what are you doing then? On your holidays? No, I'm visiting relatives. Well, that's nice. It would be, if they were still living. Meaning what? A bereavement. In the death in the family. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. That's all right, Eric. Small world, isn't it? Very. Five, he's down here. So who are you working for these days, Eric? Oh, I'm straight. Uh, oh, yeah. Respectable. <laughs> what are you doing? Hmm? Advertising Martini. Oh, you've been watching television? <laughs> yeah. Come off it, Eric. Who is it? Brumby? <laughs> Kinnear? What's it to you, anyway? Well, I've always had your welfare at heart, Eric. Besides which, I'm nosy. Well, that's not always a healthy way to be, is it? And you should know. Hmm? If I remember rightly. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're doing all right then, Eric. You're making good. Making a living. Good prospects for advancement, is it? Huh? A pension? Do you know? I had almost forgotten what your eyes looked like. They're still the same. Piss holes in the snow. Still got a sense of humour. Yes, I retain that, Eric. Piss holes in, Piss the, holes snow. in the snow. I go back to what I said earlier. It's all in the eyes, isn't it? Because he's not doing much at the beginning of the film, but he's just got that kind of mean look in his eye. You know? He just looks menacing without being menacing. Yeah. You were to bump into that man in a pub, you would not fucking cross him. You'd apologise if you bumped into him instantly. Yeah. You know, it's that thing where he walks into the club at the beginning, he snaps his finger and he goes, pint of lager in yeah. a thin glass. You know, he does oh, all of that. Yeah. I just love it, you know. And there's the bit where George Sewell and the other henchmen burst in on him and the landlady, and he reaches under the bed and he gets the shotgun. Yeah. And he's start naked and he's walking out and he's just like, you know, that's, that's not going to go off, Charlie. Is it's half yeah. cocked or whatever they say. Uh, the Jack, you know, he's, he's half cocked, is it? Yeah. And I just love the fact that, you know, they're all driving about in Mark II Jags and there was this perfect era of British gangster crime type, either TV or movie. The Sweeney would start in 74, you know, and it was mm. all of that sort of era that totally appeals to me. There's a great film around about this time called Villain. Where, ah, uh, Richard yeah, Burton. Yeah, Richard Burton and Ian Brilliant. and Shane, and it's sort Brilliant. of based on Ronnie Cray. Again, if you want to talk about that on Real Britannia, we're going to do that, mate, because one of my favourite movies of that era. It's incredible, because when you think only a couple of years before, Kane was doing 
Italian job or whatever, that's late it, 60s, it. and then we get into this two, three years later, and you think, he's matured. There's a real difference. The 60s have been discarded now. But unfortunately, what then progresses throughout the 70s is, I don't want to say pot boilers, I don't know how to describe it, but we know the reasoning behind his choices of movies for the next 10 years mm. was purely financial because of the tax system in this country was crippling him. Yeah, yeah. There was uh, a song about that, wasn't there? Yeah, I think there was. I think yeah, it, it sounds a bit like Start uh, by the Jam, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah or Batman. Uh, <laughs> sounds a bit like Batman as well. <laughs> Sorry, God. Yeah. Touchman uh, by the Beatles, everybody. <laughs> It's a shame because you get 71, you get Get Carter, and there's a couple of great things. I think Black Windmill and all these sort of little things are there, and they're not brilliant. They're not amazing, but they should have been. He should have been, bang, again, that should have been the second wave, and he should have dominated the 70s like Eastwood and Redford and Newman did. He should have been our equivalent. And it didn't happen, unfortunately. You know, we will be talking about things like the swarm and the hand. <laughs> yeah, right. We've done you know, our we... ten to one. They're my number zero, although. <laughs> yeah. But for me, that is my number one, and okay. your number two. Yeah, my number two. Yeah, a bit oh, more about this. Uh, what about the scene where he's he's having phone sex with Britt Eklund? And yes. the landlady's rocking in the chair with that yes. amazing look on her face. <laughs> a sort of slightly dreamy, oh, God, it's just brilliant. I mean, the fact she's rocking, and she she's rocking mm. harder and harder. As he's <laughs> you know more, what's more happening. Erotic. You know what's going on. Oh, it's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I think also, I haven't actually spent much time in the north of England, apart mm. from Liverpool, really. Yeah. But he's also capturing, I mean, it must be the same in London, that working man's club. I li- did listen to a podcast about Get Carter recently. It was a really good one. And they were talking, you could just smell like the beer on the floor, you know, yeah. the, the spilt beer on the floor and everything. You, and it's that it's that working man's club atmosphere. You get that singer on the stage that isn't a professional singer. Yeah. She gets up and she's singing for her gin and peps, basically, mate, yeah. or a rum and coke or whatever. She's, she's there for the evening. I'll knock out a couple of tunes, lads. Here we go. Hey, my old band said, follow the band. All that, whatever it may have been, you know, I yeah. don't know if it would have been different. But Yeah, yeah. And there was actually someone on the podcast who was from the Northeast as well. So I, I'm not saying this about that, but they were saying, yeah, it was such a depressed area at that time. Mm. Obviously, these northern towns, Liverpool, Manchester, Newcastle, they're much more glamorous and they're up and coming. God, they're yeah. probably already there. They're not up and coming, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I don't know, there's not much more to yeah. say, really. But, Back yeah. then, it, they were industrial towns that, you know, were slowly dying, unfortunately. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And then you had um, probably the most tragic character, really, in the whole film is the one who was his brother's wife or girlfriend. And she's obviously a bit of a good-time girl. I don't know if she's supposed to be a prostitute. Maybe mm. she is, or she's a good-time girl, anyway. So I won't spoil it for people who haven't seen it, but the way he kills her is just horrendous. Yeah. And she comes across as, as a really a tragic character you know it's a lot of these ambiguous characters you know i mean jack carter's not a nice guy and he does again spoiler alert get his comeuppance but at the same time he's quite justified up to a point and then obviously we get this we still don't know whether you know she was only 16 is from this film or another one but gotta go back i've said this so many times it must be in there i don't know if this is no i can tell you for a fact it's definitely not in the finished film because i watched it the other day i was listening to the commentary and i had the subtitles of the film going so i kind of watched the film Mm. and listened to the commentary a bit of a double whammy but that's definitely not in there can I also point out that Charlie, my co-host on Stinking Paws, has mentioned many times to me when we talk about this movie, read the book that this was based on. Oh, yeah. It's a very, very short like novella. There's a couple, I think. There's, there's two or three in the series. Mm. And he said they are really worth your time. One of the great things about DVDs, and I've never had any Blu-rays, I don't have a player, but DVDs is, is the commentaries. You know, you love those as well, don't you? We, we did our own one with Jaws, didn't we? We but... did. I mean, there was a time where... I sort of steered away from them for a bit because sometimes peeping behind the curtain kills the magic a yeah, little yeah. bit, doesn't it? You don't want to know how that, especially with something that's like very special effects laden or whatever. You don't want to know how that was achieved. I think there's something like Get Carter. I think the commentary was so good because it was more as to do with society. It was more of a, almost like a social commentary. And he was talking yeah. about how um, I love it when the director talks about the character and gives you more insight into how they see the character yeah because rather imagine than when the, the, the script was written they have a background don't they you know sometimes the writer the script writer whatever will have an entire history won't they yes, of what this yes. character is before they start writing for that particular film you know i don't particularly want to know jack carter's back i get enough 
from the movie to know what he's about and what he's capable of doing. And it just reinforces it as the movie goes on. You know, you, your thoughts are actually proved right. Yeah, and like I say, I won't spoil it completely, but it just gets nastier and nastier as, yeah. he, as he's he's getting closer and closer to the truth. And yeah, we won't say any more because, like I said, I'm sure we'll we'll do a review or you'll you'll do a review and I'll listen to it. Or <laughs> yeah, hopefully or, you'll um, be part of it, mate. Yeah, let's see how we yeah. go because but we both love this movie as as is evident in this list. So yeah, may well do it on film gold. In fact, but yeah, excellent. I've, I've got a list. Uh, yeah, very long list. <laughs> All right, so that was my number two. So number one, you probably guessed, is Sleuth from 1972. Yes. Yourself and uh, Stephen did appear on Film Gold. Again, I'll put it in the show notes. I first saw this film when I was about 14. I'll tell a funny story, actually. It involves my dad, because my dad likes being mentioned on my podcast. Okay. So in the film, again, I'm going to spoil it slightly. Sorry, folks. Laurence Olivier lives in Wiltshire in a big house. He's a crime writer. He invites Michael Caine. It turns out Michael Caine is having an affair with Laurence Olivier's estranged wife, who he's still married to. So they decide for an insurance scam, Michael Caine's going to rob Laurence Olivier of his jewellery with Laurence Olivier's help. Then uh, through a few twists and turns, it's very much a stage thing, obviously, isn't it? Because you've got all these twists and turns. And I've actually seen the stage version. But what was funny was I watched the first hour of it. I remember I was on a school holiday. And there's a bit where Michael Caine comes back in disguise. And I hadn't got to that bit. And for some reason, my dad started watching Sleuth. Maybe I'd recommended it to him. And my dad was further in the film with the inspectors around. And my dad said, uh, is that Michael Caine? And then I suddenly thought, oh, yeah. Oh, cheers, Dad. So for the rest of my life, I'll never know whether I would have guessed. But let me tell you, when they made that pretty awful sequel, Jude nope. Law looks so obvious that it's him. <laughs> um, Anyway, Sleuth, yeah, what can I say? I mean, I love Laurence Olivier. I love Michael Caine. A couple of things I really like with films. I like two-handers, and I like what they call limit, limited setting uh, films. This is not limited setting, though, is it? Because the creative use of that house Fairly is amazing. Is <laughs> Can you imagine on stage? Yes, that would have been so limited. But this yeah. movie takes full advantage of every nook and cranny and it does go down to the cellar and the bedrooms and all yes. that and the staircase and all that it is not stage bound at all that that is the brilliance mm. of this film that something that is a two-hander on a stage becomes cinematic it's mm. amazing the way this film has actually exploded into a into a widescreen production almost mm. just going back to what you said about the reveal I saw it probably about the same sort of age as you. I was about Mm. 11, 12, so. And it took me a while. I'm looking, I'm thinking, is that Michael Caine in makeup? And and it wasn't until, you know, the the nose comes off and the wig and all of that. that I'm like, oh, I was right, you know, but I wasn't convinced until that actually, you know, was confirmed for me. An amazing film, amazing script, perfect casting with regard to Olivier. You can totally believe that Olivier is this crime novelist, pompous, looking down on Kane, who is the son of a... Well, he's a hairdresser, isn't he? My yeah, name Tinder was a hairdresser. Comes from a family called Tindalini, so Tindalini, it's a racist element as well. Exactly. Yeah. And then you said to me, you know, you know, coming from the Italian background, from yourself, you know, you're yeah. associated with that side of things. Kane's performance... Well, there's two performances, isn't there? Mm. Three performances, if you like. You know, he mm. gives he gives the Milo Tyndall performance, he gives the Inspector Doppler, and then he gives the reveal performance afterwards. Yeah. I can yeah. see why you've put this at number one. I know your affection for this movie. Yeah, and also it, it's brilliantly art imitating life mm-hmm. because Milo Tyndall is trying to live with uh, Andrew Wyke in the story. You know, because yeah. Andrew Wyke is just dominating him, as you said. He's played so brilliantly by Laurence Olivier and Michael Caine's trying to live with Laurence Olivier. And in this, um, again, one of the memoirs I read, you know, he didn't sugarcoat it. He said Laurence Olivier was a very, very difficult person to work with on one level. My success was cultural as well as popular. Witness the fact that I was asked to film Sleuth with Sir Laurence Olivier, directed by Joe Mankiewicz. This honour was not without its disadvantages. Laurence Olivier had been the foremost star and director in the theatre for many, many years. He had worked in an atmosphere of extraordinary power, where the job of everyone around him had always been, other actors included, to get the great man's performance on the stage. I found myself suddenly in a very tricky situation. He would place himself in the best possible location for a scene, 
and then leave me somehow to act around him. If I had a line that interfered with one of his moves, he would just tell the director to cut it. Eventually, I went to Joe Mankiewicz and told him of my problem, as if he hadn't noticed. And he said, I'll look after you. Every time Larry has suggested that I cut one of your lines, I promised I will cut it in the editing. This was true, I remembered. But then I said, Did you see the two shot this morning, which was supposed to be a 50-50? He went upstage and pulled me around until you could only see the side of my face. I saw that, Joe said sympathetically. The next time he does it, turn right around until your back is to the camera, and I will come in over his shoulder from the other side for a close-up on you. He'll soon stop it, he smiled. Don't worry, Michael. This isn't the theatre. We do have editing and close-ups. I returned to the fray with my confidence boosted, and a very valuable new trick that I've used to great advantage ever since. But a nice, kind of a nice guy, a decent guy. Yeah. At the same time. There's a couple of stories, aren't there? Have you heard the one? Um, I'm sure we covered this when we did we it. We must have done so good. So you got the one about um, how should I address you? And yeah. he said, the first time you meet me, I'm Lord Olivier. The next, and you're Mr. Kane. From then, I'm Larry and you're Mike, kind of thing. <laughs> and then um, what did he say at the end of the filming? Something about, I thought you were an assistant, but now I realize you're an equal or something. Yes, that, that was it, yeah. At the beginning of the uh, filming... Michael Caine was worried because he knew Olivier was going to dominate him or try and dominate him. Yes. Laurence Olivier was cutting scenes, was telling the director to cut scenes. Joseph Mankiewicz, I think it was, mm. who's the brother of the guy who wrote Citizen Kane. Yeah. Mankiewicz. Yeah. And Mankiewicz said to him, don't worry, Michael, I'll protect you, basically. I'll make sure you're not cut out the film, basically. And you kind of think, you know, I mean, Brando was a prima donna. People like Orson Welles, they're prima donnas. But, you know, yeah. I guess Olivier... There's a very good uh, memoir I did called Confessions of an Actor, which I re- really should reread. Uh, you probably think you've got, I've it. got it. I'm looking on the bookshelves mm. now. I think I've got it. But yeah, it's that two hundred. As you said, it's a limited setting, but made full use of. And there's also a sort of labyrinthine quality about the house. And um, mm. it's interesting that I find um, I find Tim Burlington Place fascinating because the house is so tiny. Yes. I find this fascinating because the house is so big. And you think <laughs> when there's a scene where he's talking about, um, you know, back in the 30s or whatever. There used to be hundreds of people, and you get the idea that Laurence Olivier's character is also quite sad and lonely, isn't he? Yeah. That's what kind of gets revealed towards the end yeah. of the film. He's yeah. this writer, isn't he? And, and and being a writer must be quite a lonely existence. Mm. Because Definitely. you've only got yourself to rely on to your creative output. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the first scenes is him talking into a tape recorder in the in the maze. Yes, yes. Isolated, away from everybody else, and nobody can touch him. Yeah. And then to have... Milo Tyndall intrude on his life the way mm. he does quite personally, you know, but then he's a very intelligent man, you know, and he has this entire knowledge of crime procedural dramas and novels and, and yeah. the way things should work out if it was a proper, that, that's the great thing about this. You're, no, you're, you're a detective. You should be when he said meets Doppler, you know, you should be saying this, you know, it's like, yeah, <laughs> I think that's um, it when we did the review. Yeah. In a funny way, when the um, Doppler comes, it's almost like it's Andrew White's wet dream, isn't it? The inspector coming. It's a challenge, and he, isn't and it? he's having to explain uh, what happened. And, of course, yeah. he gets completely stitched up like a kipper. And the comedy, you don't forget. You know, the clown, the, this, mm. yeah, that music, like, duh, 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 <laughs> duh, 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 and he and he falls over in the clown costume. Yeah. And then there's a snooker match where Laura, they start having a game of snooker mm. and Lawrence Olivier just clears the table. He just cheats. He goes, what are you doing with that cue in your hand? That's what it does I was get waiting shot. for you to miss. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's a very dark film. I mean, I, I, gave, I showed, um, I got my parents to watch it actually a few mm. years ago. Yeah. And my mum said, God, I didn't realise how dark that was. Because they've got that little bit of trickery at the end. When the ending comes, all these little toys that he's got, you call them That's automatons or something. Yeah. They all come alive, don't they? It's a bit of yep. a surreal bit. It's all about manhood in a funny way. You know, they're, they're competing because it even, it even comes out that Laurence Olivier has got this Finnish um, floozy, for want of a better word, but it turns yeah. out he's impotent. And that's obviously almost a kind of a metaphor, isn't it? You know, and, and it really is a battle of wits, and I, I just think it's fantastic. You come here and announce your intention to steal away my wife. You pry into my manhood. You lecture me on ignoble minds. And you mock the creation of my life. St. John, Lord, merit you. 
How? They're all real bullets this time. The game's over, Andrew. I'm going home now. Well, not really. A very good games player. I mean to say, never play the same game three times running. Andrew, don't forget. Be sure and tell them it was just a bloody game. <laughs> Yeah, go back to our review, listeners, because um, I think um, you really liked it. I think Stephen liked it as well, didn't he? Everybody. I don't know anybody that doesn't like the movie. Mm. And it's a bit of an underseen gem as well. Yeah. It, it's not screened. It's not on DVD now. It's, you can't get it. Oh, you can't it? actually buy it now. Okay. As we said earlier in part one, Death Trap in 1982 is mm. a kind of a spiritual sequel. And then there was yeah. a pretty awful sequel, which had all the makings of being a great film. It had Michael Caine, Jude Law... Written by uh, Harold Pinter and directed yeah. by Branagh, and it just didn't work really. No. The one interesting thing is that instead of having a labyrinthine house, it's a very closed environment, and it's lots of technology. A lot of glass as well, if I remember. It's like yeah. a big open like view to the outside as well. It's something like that, yeah. yeah. It's, not, it's not. I mean, it's not that bad. It's just. It's it's, it's not sleuth. <laughs> no, it doesn't hold a candle to the original. Um, similar to we didn't mention the remake of Get Carter. Oh, yeah, I was just about to mention that. Because <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kane is in that. So uh, we will get yeah. to our uh, uh, honourable mentions and turkeys in a second. All right, I think we've done nearly two and a half hours. So uh, could we scoot through this last bit? Honourable mentions and just anything else, basically, yeah? Yeah, could we just read out the honourable mentions, really? Because I think... Um... I've just got a dozen here, but I'll just whittle it down to whatever, mate. Absolutely. All right, well, i got Dark Knight, Children of Men, I already mentioned. Side House Rules, wasn't too keen on the accent, but a decent film. Mona Lisa, I love. Too Late the Hero, that's an interesting one, a war film with uh, Cliff Robinson. Yep. Yep. That? I was saying earlier, I wanted to get to Dirty Rotten Scoundrels and I didn't get there, so that might have got in my top ten, I'm not sure. Quite American, we've already talked about. That's it. Uh, I guess Zulu didn't quite make my top ten, but wasn't far behind. And you? I had Educate Me, you spoke about Little Voice. Oh, yes. Jaws 4, Blame It on Rio. Skates of Victory, you spoke about Dress to Kill. Oh, yeah, I forgot about Brian mention. De Palma, yeah. And then I had, like, the three sort of, like, Irwin Allen-type disaster movies, Beyond the Poseidon Adventure, The Swarm, 
I had a shanty I was going to mention. Oh, yeah, it's got Shakira Kane in it. Yeah, it? and then I was going to do the three like war movies, Eagle Has Landed, Battle of Britain, Bridge Too Far. And I was also going to mention Jack the Ripper at one point as well. That was very close to being in the top ten. Uh, it was the two-part TV thing with Lewis Collins. Which is the one with Ben Kingsley, and it sort of played as a... That's without comedy. a clue. Oh, that's without Sherlock Holmes, isn't it? Yeah, and Ben Kingsley is... What's Conan on? Doyle or Watson or uh, yeah, but Michael Caine is brought on as a, he's an actor. He's brought on to play Sherlock uh, Holmes. Is that worth watching? Should I watch that? I've never seen it. It's crap. Oh, is it? Oh. <laughs> Escape to Victory. Yeah, I said I wasn't sure whether that was good or so bad. It's good somewhere in the middle. The Swarm, as you mentioned, I will never not laugh at the idea of Richard Widmark mm-hmm. with a gun trying to shoot individual bees. It, it could happen. It's fine. Of course it could, yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's like the shark, the great white shark family vendetta, isn't it? You yeah, know, I'm, I'm a sucker for, like, disaster movies and, you know, yeah. that era of the... That was a disaster, so, that one. It was a disaster of a movie, but it's compelling, isn't it? That's the mm. thing. You, you shouldn't be watching it, but you just find yourself doing it, you know? Mm. This is not Michael Caine, but I'd say of those... Of those 70s disasters, do you think best films are probably Towering Inferno and yes. the original Poseidon Adventure? They are the two yeah, that are the, the benchmark best, for me. They? Yeah, and, and yeah. I watch them quite regularly because they're not bad movies, to be mm. honest. They're pretty good, yeah. I like them. Yeah. The weird thing about The Swarm is that you've got Michael Caine, you've even got Henry Fonda in there, Richard Widmark. Mm-hmm. You've got some really good Catherine Ross. This some was the really thing. good people in there, haven't you? This was the thing. They got A-list actors that were A-list 20, 30 years previously. Yeah to headline you know but then they bring in the current stars of the era and Mm. michael Caine just doesn't fit anywhere in that demographic in 1976 77 wherever the swarm was released yeah Yeah. Yeah. because he wasn't a list and he wasn't classic hollywood you know it's just like why is it michael because he wanted the quick buck that's all it boiled down to the hand is a fucking awful movie what irony as well it's michael Caine and oliver stone for god's sake yeah I mean, that's incredible. What a good film they could have made. <laughs> you know? As we said at the beginning of all of this, there's highs and lows, there's ups and downs. And that's what makes him such an interesting actor, such a compelling actor, and such a resilient actor for the fact that he's been acting since the early 50s mm-hmm. until, you know, the next couple of months. Still you know, doing he's, it. He's, yeah, he's literally on the cusp of retirement now. God bless him. We love him. We both love him. And... We do, this is absolutely. a wonderful tribute to a man on his 90th birthday, mate. Thank you for, you know, organising this. You're very welcome. Thanks for coming on. I think I had a couple more turkeys. That was it. Yeah, bullseye. 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 I had more. Yes. Mm. Watched it the once. Again, can't remember. Nothing. Michael Winner, wasn't it's it? It's two Canes and two Roger Moores. They play uh, two oh, characters each. No, no memory of that whatsoever. Michael Winner was the director, if I remember. I'm trying to forget it, to be honest. Yeah. Um, Blame it on Rio, you mentioned. That kind of has a charm. That has a charm, I think. Blame it on Rio is not bad. It's a bit creepy now right, when you yeah. think about it. Yeah, it's not too bad. And then uh, Get Carter, you mentioned, there was a spate of um, Michael Caine films being remade, wasn't there? Because there was Alfie with Jude Law. There was The Italian Job oh, with Mark God, Wahlberg. Yeah. I think I've seen that once. I saw that one. Then they did a sequel to it called, <laughs> I might be making this up. I thought it was called the Brazilian job, but that could be something else. completely. <laughs> I'm sure there is a sequel to it. Well, perhaps we could end. Uh, let's just end with this one thing before we sign off. What about the end of the Italian job? There were various theories about how they could get the gold. So again, the, Somebody they, proved that it could be done. Theater, you know, they? And if they shifted one way and spread their weight out another, or they could all get off, and let the gold fall to the bottom of the chasm, and then they'd retrieve it later. Oh, that's it. And, and then, the, writer, the writer had an idea. I don't know if they filmed different endings or they yeah. wrote different endings. One of the two. One of them was that they recovered the gold, but then the mafia were waiting for them. That's it. There was going to be a sequel. Oh. There was going to be a sequel at some yeah. point. But yeah. it's one of those movies that doesn't need a sequel, doesn't need a resolution. Yeah. It is one of those great, perfect cliffhanger endings. It is yeah. a cliffhanger. That's you know, exactly yeah, and I think it's clever because it's quite a risk, isn't it? Because we've talked loads of times about in those days before, well, I guess I guess there were video, well, maybe some people had video recorders, but you went for a night out in the cinema and it, it could have easily backfired that people would have said, well, I wanted a resolution. I'm not happy with that. Mm-hmm. So they took a bit of a risk with that, but it worked because the film's yeah. good enough, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that whole two hours leading up to that, perfectly great movie, like we yeah, said. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right. Well, listen, thank you very much. We've done well. Two and a half hours odd. He's got to do the editing. Is that you? Or? No. No, that, that'll be you. Yeah, so. I volunteered, didn't I? Yeah, no. <laughs> now, listen, thank you very much. Uh, I think we've done this justice. We've done the great man and happy birthday. And I'm curious to see in the middle of March whether he makes an appearance. I wonder if he will he be interviewed or I don't know. What health is he in? Because he's still making films, isn't he? As we said. Yeah, as I say, Medieval was the last thing I've seen his name against. Mm. And that looks like it may have been recorded last year, possibly as a mm. cameo type thing. Hopefully, let's get another 10 years out of him. I want to celebrate <laughs> his 100 years, mate, for God's yeah. sake. Yeah, because we were talking about Yoko earlier. She's not in good health and hasn't been for a few years. But um, I think with Michael Caine, I think his reputation is secure. wouldn't matter what he did, even if he if he announced he was doing The Swarm too. I think he, all is you know forgiven, what? you know. I would be first in the queue for that. Oh, would you? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And you could watch that on my behalf. So. <laughs> He's a national treasure. And, um, yeah, the three books, what was it? What's it all about? Elephant to Hollywood and Blowing the Bloody Doors Off. Yeah. And, and there's what were also, the other ones you had? I've got another one called Arise, Sir Michael Caine, which is the mm. biography by William Hill. There's a sort of a pictorial thing called My Name is Michael Caine and mm. Bill uh, mm. is the editor of that one but they're all out there but my recommendation is what's it all about all right that's brilliant there's not actually that many documentaries there's one called michael Caine breaking the mold which is pretty good there's obviously loads of interviews he's, he's always got loads of good anecdotes because he, he was some sort of raconteur wasn't he in the 80s had a yeah restaurant we, chain we, he is an accomplished actor as we've said many times today there is a comedic element to some of that um definitely but uh, that's just because he's so iconic, is what you said at the beginning, isn't it? He's so iconic, and um, I guess he did get typecast for a while, but then again, you know, he's had a fairly diverse lot of roles, and I think this renaissance from about the 90s has made a huge difference to his legacy. Should we conclude with that? Um, the legacy is yeah. secure, would you say? The legacy could have mm. been lost. I'm not saying it's cider house rules or whatever that would have saved him or Hannah and her sisters. You know, we had these wilderness years with some golden nuggets in between. Mm. But he came almost to the fore, mid-90s, possibly just after, actually, you know, and rekindled the Michael Caine that we knew and loved from the 60s. I'm not saying it's a shame that there's some shit in between because some of the shit is quite enjoyable. And I, is, go back, I go back to it and I love it. Like yeah. we said, the swarm, the hand, some of that crap that he did. Jaws Fine. 4. Jaws, Jaws 4, not got a problem with that at all. Yeah, it's just, it depends what mood you're in. You know, if, if you want something that's silly mm. and you can get in that headspace, then the swarm is quite funny. It's entertaining. Mm. Yeah. You know? Okay, for my audience, for Film Gold audience, Scott's podcasts are Rainbow Valley, Real Britannia, Stinking Paws, and um, Talking Pictures TV you're involved with. and. Yep. The Rainbow Valley chart show, is that on Mixcloud? That's on Mixcloud now. It's a 60s chart show every Sunday. Yeah. Okay, it'll all be in the show notes. And then for Scott's audience, my podcast, Film Gold, obviously this one. Glass Onion. John Lennon. Glass Onion on John Lennon, deep dive into John Lennon. Expanding out to, you know, the, the era in which he lived and a bit of the psychology. And then Life and Life Only is about psychology as well and alternative media. So thanks uh, once again for doing this. Hope you enjoyed it, mate. Cheers, mate. Thank you, Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone, for listening. You know, they, they put blue plaques on where famous people were. And were yeah. But what I didn't understand until I got there is the guy said to me, this, who was in charge of the Southwark Borough Council, he says, you do know you're supposed to be dead to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, how could I do it if I'm dead? <laughs> he said, it's not what I meant. He said, they only put plaques up for dead people, but we made an exception in your case. <laughs> And he looked up and he said, but we left a space. <laughs> it said, born 1933, hyphen, and there's a big space. <laughs> Is that your thinking? Yeah, except if I thought, wonder what date that's going to be. <laughs> but the great thing about growing old is 
you haven't got an alternative. The only alternative is death. So you might as well be cheerful and have the greatest possible life you can have. Because if, I always meet people who are living as though it's a rehearsal and the show's going to be later. And I feel like saying, this is the show. Yes. This is it. It's not a rehearsal. Yes. It's yeah. not it. You've got the costume on. Look. Yeah. I mean, are you older and wiser? Do the two go together? No. No? No. <laughs> that no. God. I knew I was supposed to be a wiser, but it, 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 it didn't happen for me. <laughs> and the other thing too about, about this, about this right, there, is, there is a thing about growing older, you've said everything you've got to say, you've heard everything that anyone's got to say, which is why you often find old people talking to themselves, they don't need anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great theory. <laughs>